Hi, I'm Jeff Lawton, and we're going to take you through an introduction to permaculture. Permaculture is a design system conceived by Bill Mollison in the 1970s. It's a system for sustainable living on Earth that benefits all creatures and supplies all the needs of humanity. systems are failing us miserably, resource depletion, water storage, degrading landscape, food shortage, climate change. All these things are negative and we don't need to focus on them completely but we need to look at how we can positively design our way out of this problem. How we can come up with solutions that will supply all our needs and benefit the environment and create absolute abundance. That's what we're going to take you through. A design system that gives you a positive view on the future. Something that you can engage in and feel meaningful. And that's what we hope you'll enjoy getting the sense of while you're watching this DVD. It's a matter of freedom, isn't it? So we can just let you go into a self-managing system. Off you go. Permaculture is a design system, but it starts off with ethics. It's a movement of people that starts with ethics. The ethics were derived from many traditional ethics that people have used to govern the way they behave all around the world. The ethics have been condensed, they're concise, and they come just to three. Earth care, care of the earth and all its living and non-living systems. Central to this, is a life ethic. All living things have an intrinsic worth. People care, the care of people. In permaculture, people are central to the way we design so that we can supply our needs in a sustainable way. Sustainable design, central to permaculture, to be sustainable. If it's not caring for people, if it's making life hard for people or it's enslaving people, or it's creating hardship, it can't possibly be permaculture. Permaculture is also people care as well as earth care. The third ethic, return of sur surplus, a fair share. The return of surplus energy, needs, time, information. Anything that's in surplus should be returned to the first two ethics. There's nothing more worthwhile for surplus to be applied back to earth care and people care. In this way, we end up in an abundant world. So this is a very important beginning, and we must realize that ethics are at the beginning of permaculture. This creates a, a new landscape, a new society of people and land use and resource use. It's not just a little bit green. It's not just a little bit different. It's not people living in a slightly different way. It's, it's people living way beyond 
subsistence, it's abundance. Where does permaculture lead to? It leads to absolute abundance. What is it about? It's about science and ethics. Permaculture is sustainable. It's about sustainability. Sustainable needs to be defined clearly. A sustainable system produces more energy than it consumes, enough in surplus to maintain and replace its components and the system itself over its lifetime. Therefore, if you're looking for a sustainable system as an example, living systems, natural systems, Systems fueled by the energy of the sun, the source of all life energy on earth, the sun, is the most sustainable system. And there we can find models. There we can look for examples. There we can define true resources, living resources that are renewable, endlessly renewable, as long as the sun continues to shine. We don't have to worry about the renewability of, of our resources because the depletion of energy, the spent energy, the entropy, energy that's been contained that is spent, is actually enhanced by living systems when we design to trap the energy of the sun. We're very much about resources defined in a natural way, yields, as in yields of a system so that we can plan very long-term yields and very fast yields from a system. We are designers of systems that mimic nature, systems that run on the same patterns as nature. And when you look at natural systems, they're extremely diverse. Diversity in nature links to stability. Stability creates fertility, and fertility gives us that design productivity. Diversity is not just a collection though. Diversity is about interaction, interactivity. The interaction between the diverse elements gives us that ecosystemic, that life web type stability. Our themes in design very much focus on those models so that our system, our teacher, is the natural system. Stacking diversity into systems stores and creates an energy surplus for us in design. But we don't just stack in the physical sense, we actually look at stacking in time. Time stacking systems through succession. Looking at succession in natural systems, the reparative mechanisms, the mechanics of nature, if you like. Those systems can be replicated, but they can actually be improved. And improving on nature is something that is fine if we're actually in a positive mode and we're benefiting nature's reparative functions, we can stack in space and in time. And that's a really exciting concept. I know it's full of fungi. If I just pull out a branch here, <laughs> there's all kinds of fungi. <laughs> Everything's going back down to soil. It's just rotten. Six months ago, it was a tree. <laughs> We've purposely put it back down to the soil. This job's done. Time stacked out. Produced mulch for six years. Been cut and mulched and dropped and produced. And then it's decided it's finished, job done. And before it's even hit the ground, the fungi's breaking it down. So um, I'd say if I gave that a bit of a kick, it'd go down right now. So I'm just gonna do that. And uh, we're just gonna put it 
on the ground. So permaculture systems are very much about polycultural systems, systems that include many different elements and many different elements stacked together that don't just function at one time but extend their functions over time. So these systems we have to learn how to design. We have to look at those concepts and say that's how nature works. How do we then improve on those functions? And that's very much permaculture. Yield through diversity is not about trophy hunter mentality, about what's the biggest crop we get over the species that we choose. It's not about monoculture where we have one crop, one field, one yield at one time. Permaculture design is about energy efficiency. So it's very much about how much energy do you put in and how much energy do you get out. So how much effort do you put into creating a yield? Through all the interactions between the diverse elements, through all the stacking of time of yield over an area, we end up with a very efficient system. We have multiple yield over multiple time with very low inputs and extremely efficient output. So here we are next to a water system, which is also next to a food forest, which is also next to a productive dam, uh, bamboo system. We're in a polyculturally designed farm where there are multiple yields almost every moment of the day, every day of the year. The efficiency of yield over the area in relation to the energy input is extremely high. Because it benefits nature, because it benefits the landscape exactly the way that natural systems do. This is how you come up with good design. It's not about the yield per element, it's about the yield over the area in relation to the energy that you've used to create that yield. A lot of systems end up producing on their own with the minimum amount of en energy input. In fact, they will produce over time quite often without any energy input and no maintenance at all. It just takes a very small amount of energy to keep them running and just a very specific understanding. So, instead of a hundred hours of meaningless work and one hour's thinking, you're more likely in a permaculture system to be spending a hundred hours of meaningful thinking and one hour of also meaningful work. A much more efficient system and a much more pleasurable system to be working amongst and living amongst. This is how we'll stabilize society. This is how we'll stabilize the world's environment by supplying our needs in a way that creates a sustainable world. methods of design. In natural systems, every element performs more than one function, in fact many functions. And every function is supported by many elements. So when we look at the method of design, techniques that we use are only how you do something. It's a one-dimensional element, a technique. But to take that a little bit further is to include a time element. And that means using a strategy. A strategy is how and when you do something. So that is two dimensions. But in our design science, permaculture is about patterning of design. In patterning, 
we use multiple functions, multiple elements, and we emphasize their connections. So it's multi-dimensional. That's design. And for that, we need to analyze elements. We need approaches to design. So all the elements that we use, animal, vegetable, structural, structures, plants, trees, animal systems, they all have to be analyzed so that we know what inputs they need, what outputs they produce, and their general characteristics, their intrinsic characteristics. This is an analysis process. So then we can pattern the assembly of elements and their connections. So we're starting to look at design processes. We're starting to look at design methods. If you're looking at an animal, it's its breed characteristics. If you're looking at a structure, you're looking at its performance and materials and, and the energy embodiment of the materials. And you're looking at plants, you're looking at the way they gild and their functions and the climates they come from and their tolerances. This is analysis of elements. chicken. We can use this as an example of analysis of an element and it is often used. So we look at a chicken and say what does the chicken need? Well a chicken obviously needs food. Um, a chicken needs good air and in a humid climate like this it needs a good air flow. In a cold climate it needs a warm air um, so remove the stress of the bird. A, a chicken needs other chickens to produce more chickens. They also need grit because they have a, a gizzard here in the throat, a muscle that grinds up hard shelled seeds. It needs dust, dust for a dust bath. It needs good quality water. Chickens are very bad at muddying and manuring their water. A chicken needs control. If you don't control your chickens, they'll decide what germinates in your garden. They'll free range through systems and scratch through all the areas you don't need them to scratch through. As well as control, a chicken also needs protection because they're easily predated on. Then they also need good roosts. They need somewhere to roost. They need somewhere to lay their eggs. So these are the, the needs of a chicken. So then there are the, the products and behaviors of a chicken. Um, they obviously produce eggs. They produce meat. They produce manure, good quality manure. They also produce feathers, which are high in protein and become nitrogen in the compost heap. And because it's a warm-blooded animal, it produces, yes, it produces heat. So a lot of chickens together will actually start to heat up a room or a glass house or a, a, a growing space. Their behaviours are that they, they scratch, they shred up mulch, they manure mulch, they eat seeds and break down the cycles of weeds and they eat pest larvae. Then we have the intrinsic characteristics of a chicken. This is a Barnvelder, a particular breed, pretty good egg layer, not a bad meat bird, it's a multi-purpose bird. You get some birds that are really good meat birds and other birds that are really good egg layers. These are the intrinsic factors, the breed characteristics of this element. This is a, a classic example of an element analysis. Now, we can go through all of the elements of design in this way. All of the animals, all of the plants, all of the structures. They all have needs, products, and intrinsic factors. This way we can choose good elements with good connections to other elements. If we look at their products, 
they have to be they have to be used by the system. Anything that is oversupplied in a way that can't be put into productive use goes into chaos. And as, if that's a product, it can often be just interpreted as a pollution. So all of their products need to be used by the system, and all of their needs should be provided by the system. So a system becomes a closed cycle, <laughs> an ecosystemic system, a system that cycles within itself. So the landscape of humanity, the farm, the urban area, the urban landscape becomes like an organism to itself, supplying its own needs through good design analysis. This is only one way to design. We can also look at others, so we can use multiple methods of design approach. And we'll like to also examine and explore observation, design through observation. observations in nature and the principles that we observe in natural systems lead us to design harmonic and efficient systems. We can see all kinds of examples around us, even in cities, even in the country. We can see all kinds of examples that lead us towards good design. Good design makes it efficient and that gives us a very efficient productivity, stability and harmony with nature. Natural systems are our teachers, lessons and examples to act by. Here amongst our okra plants, I have one of our local weeds. It's a spiky little character, but it's an amaranth, an amaranth weed. And it actually has some grain in the heads. This is an indication that amaranth grows well here. So that's what we've planted as one of our main grain crops. And behind me you can see red amaranth and behind the corner a whole row of golden amaranth all growing really well. It's the same as our little friend here, the weed, is also an amaranth indicating this is good amaranth country. An observation and a lesson from nature indicators. All we have to do is keep our eyes open we can make these assumptions and guesses, trial them out, usually they work. We look at landscape in a series of zones. And we go from zone one, which is an inner zone closest to the center of energy, which is usually the house or the main human activity. This is an area that has most visits, most use, and it has the most density of elements. And here there are special elements, things that are of great value, but take great care of management. Zone two is the next zone out and immediately is larger and zone two is actually a broader zone where there are less elements and the maintenance is a little bit more vague. So out in zone two we have our food forests, we have our forage crops, where we may grow crops for animals to provide their food. Our broad acre crops, where we grow our main carbohydrate foods or our main foods. 
So our main crop gardens, not the kitchen garden, but the broader main crop garden, zone two. And in some climates, colder climates, our firewood maybe produce there a woodlot. When we go out again, right, we move into zone three, which is a much broader zone. Here you have the larger farm type systems of land use, where we have grazing animals, we have large windbreak systems, the water bodies will be larger here if we have dams or swales. The mulch systems out there are very rough, so we're dealing with rough mulches, we're dealing with large branches and sticks and logs. We've got animals and broader tree systems. And some of our very large main crops on large acreage may also be out in zone three. And if we have a, a great demand for firewood, that also might be out in zone three. So this is the broad area. When we move out to zone four, zone four is farm forestry whatever type of forestry that may be. And there are many types of forestry, not just for timber, but for poles, for craft, for bee forage, for, for animal systems, where animals gather from the fallen products of the forest, fungi forest, a multiple variation of forest. But it, zone four is forestry of some type. And that's a, a simplified choice and a much larger system in potential. Then we go out to zone five. Zone five is the wilderness. Zone five is the wild system, the natural system. And there's very little we do in zone five, although we can sustainably gather and we can sustainably hunt. There are two other elements that come into this. Slope and orientation will change the shape and form of the zonation pattern. Zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, they'll all change in relation to how steep the land is and which way it faces, whether it faces the sun or the shade or the west or the east. So appropriate placement in relation to the energy needed to work that zone will change the shape of that zone. And the human element, the element that works the land or the element that interacts with the land will also change the size and shape of zones. So if we have a steep slope near the house or the center of energy on the property, it will jump quickly into one of the outer zones because of the energy needed to work on a steep slope. Zones are never exactly um, repeated in form and size ratios, but they are appropriately placed in relation to the land itself and the human use. It's an energy efficient planet from the inside out. So when we're planning zones and the placement of element in zone, elements in zones, we actually look for an analysis process where we say, how many visits per year are we going to make to that element? That'll give us an idea of where it fits in a zone and then which elements fit together so that they interact together and we can get multi-purpose interactions on the same stacked job energy pathway we're starting to put elements together in relation to ship to each other within their numbers of energy requirements per year, their number of visits. So it's a very energy efficient planning system. Sector analysis is how we observe the energies on the site of any design. And we look at the energies that actually flow through a site. These can be the winter sun angles, sunrise, sunset, and midday. The summer sun angles, again, sunrise, sunset, midday. The prevailing winds, the good views, the bad views, the noise or the dust 
winds that we might want to block, the flood and frost that we might want for purposes or not, the cold wind of wind, all of these things are potential energies which are on any one site. These, by design, change the zones, reduce the stress on the site, therefore enhancing the system and the life on the of the system, create microclimate, can be identified in many different ways through things like observation of wind shear on trees to get us the prevailing winds. We also will need to find records and information and local knowledge. It's very simple. The choices are, yes, we want that energy and we invite it into the site and encourage it, or no, we don't want that energy. It's not beneficial to us and we want to block it. All of this will be a great advantage to our design process and the result of our design. So the sector energy map fits over the top of our zone map and changes the form of the zone map and starts to give us a pattern in design. This is what creates the beneficial microclimate creation and stress reduction of a site. It's that integral interaction between the two elements sector energies and energy efficiency of zone planning. Well, here we are visiting a, a classic zone one garden that's well established very energy efficient. We're just a few meters from the house and we've got food production everywhere. We've got very functional footpaths that are all controlled by beneficial ground covers. We've got mulch production in surplus, all different types, high mineral comfrey that can be added to gardens. There's animal systems around us that we can add manure. This is really classic zone one. Into the, into the zone one scape, we're literally going through an envelope of passion fruit and food through a trellis in a real home situation. We have small footpaths surrounded by food, edible Brazilian spinach, strawberries, papaya, turmeric, ginger, edible edges and clumping plants, herbs that can be picked. This is a foodscape, but it's also quite ornamental. We go on through zones within the zones. There's cardamom right here. There's choco above us. We're next to a pizza oven. Functional structure. There's seedlings being grown on a table. In here we have small ponds, ornamental plants, more passion fruit. Passion fruit and choco above us. And the framed scene, the window that we look out on, is this green productive foodscape. This is zone one. It's literally controlled by the density and diversity of planets. This is the urban habitat of sustainable humanity. This we have to understand. This is our integration of built structure with living, productive, sustainable food and functional landscaping. This is the future of our supply lines. Here we have an acerola cherry, one of the highest fruits in the world in vitamin C. Oh, it's right here, like a vitamin C pill, near the house. Down a, a, a footpath surrounded by herbs, next to a natural ionized swimming pool. No chlorine involved here. We have food plants growing right up against the pool. I can see a, a kangkong there, Ipomoea aquatica, a natural spinach of the tropics. We have bell peppers, chili peppers, grapevine, Lost all its leaves in winter, letting the winter light come through, but would be a complete green shade in summer as a functional feature. 
Underneath we've got Tahitian spinach, right outside the door, as a really good subtropical leaf crop. So we've got all kinds of foods very close and very convenient. Typical zone one planning. There are human friendly elements here. There are garden seats. Again, more bird baths, little ponds. So there's a, a diversity of, of habitat, predator habitat, frog ponds, rockeries for lizards, perches for birds, bird baths to attract in the birds. It's a friendly habitat to people. Here's a big custard apple. <laughs> um, here's a citrus right behind us with a passion fruit, with cardamoms, with papayas. There's just layers and layers and layers of food here. There's root crops, clumping crops, herbs. There's more than I could mention, but it's all stability by diversity occupying the space. This is a very, very secure landscape to live in, and it's a landscape that you feel as if you're insured, your existence is insured, and your health is insured. And it's vital, and it's still interesting, and it's still aesthetic. This is not an untidy landscape. This is a landscape that is very beautiful, and it's very, very healthy for you and other creatures. It's not exclusive. It's not a, a landscape where we have to go to war against weeds or a war against pests. Everything is in balance, and the surplus is our supply line, our needs we see that we are actually interacting with solar energy and feeding back to the grid. We have solar hot water. We have solar electricity. We have a natural vent on the top of the house cooling it down. And we even have a satellite dish. We're not exclusive as if technology is some kind of enemy. We're interacting with technology in an appropriate way. This is a permaculture design system, one that really works. So as we transit through zone one, we pass a lime that's hanging over from zone two. So out of the gate, and very quickly, we go through into a second zone. This is the broader zone of forest, and there's fruit on the floor immediately. I've got to step over fruit. We've got understories of coffee in production. We've got different types of fruit trees all around us. We're in a broad zone with rough mulches. And this, on the edge of zone one, also joins on to zone three. In this case, there is a zone three because there's a small amount of pasture. And we actually have a small dairy on this property. Now, as we walk around, this op more open forest allowing citrus to grow, there's a, a great diversity of mixtures of trees. It's not just one species. There's chocolate pudding fruit, black sapodi, Chinese raisin, longan, mulberries, nitro and fixing trees. A whole mixture of forestry. It's well established and it's quite open. It's an, it's an easy system to walk through. It's an easy system to pick. Because this system's almost 13 years old now. As we get to the edge, we come up to a section here where zone three meets zone two, and we've got a small dairy yard. So there's just one Jersey cow, milked every day, produces all the milk and all the cheese and butter for this family. And it's fed from a small pasture that actually gains nutrient from zone one and zone two drainage and the surplus forage crops that are also mulch crops double as a support for the cow. So there's cut forage surplus in zone one and two that's fed over to our cow, which returns manure back into zone one and zone two. These are simple cycles. They're all cycles that work very well and create a very healthy environment. So here's a conventional road hard surface road coming through the landscape and picking up water. Now the drain has been picked up so it comes into this property 
and fills these two dams on either side of the driveway. These two dams then picking up the nutrient of life, water plants, fish, and all the other things that naturally occur in water and are encouraged in this situation, they then, when an overflow occurrences happen, and that's quite quick with that feed of water off that road, overflow into the system and soak the nutrient down through zone two, and that soaks into zone three. This is a matter of just stacking natural functions through zones, making connections between elements that most people wouldn't see connections for. A road, to a dam, to a productive diverse forest, to a nutrient flow, to a small pasture. Simple connections make all the productivity easier. This is zone planning, this is design function. This makes life, productivity, healthy systems easier to achieve. Design planning. Here we have a, an organic matter swale, full of all kinds of organic matter. Um, broken down branches, bits of old furniture. There's boxes in here that are going to go back to the soil. There's old overalls. There's even old bits of furniture. And it'll all break down in this humid material because there's a swale under here that's trapping moisture. Bananas are sucking that moisture and living on it. There's banana fruit above me. What a great appropriate system. There's nothing fancy about this, but it works. And that's the main thing. Here we are walking again through zone one. I'll pick up a bit of forage on the way through. And our cows are waiting for us. They're on the edge of zone three. So here's zone two is kind of missing at this point, but it doesn't matter. We're joining zone one to zone three. And uh, they're, really, they're really happy about that because they can share in the production and they can produce for us easily harvested fertilizer, as in their manure, mineral rich with our nutrient from our zone one. Good design. This is where things become very functionally energy efficient. We've got all kinds of elements around us that make our work easier and production simply a matter of functional interrelationships. from zone three and our, in this case, grazing paddock with our dairy cow and calf through into zone four and quickly into zone five with a sanctuary dam and a palm lined valley of wilderness. The edge of the system, zone five, cares for itself. And there's a beautiful backdrop of serenity and sanctuary. Zone 4, farm forestry, the outer zone where we simply have to choose what sort of forest it is we're going to grow. We can manage the forest to be more productive for poles or timber, forage, panage where crops, products fall to the ground that animals eat, fungi forest, bee forage, craft forest, wilderness forest, native forest, regrowth forest, or all together. We can include bamboo, native and non-native or just native, whatever you like. This is zone four, what kind of forest is it? That's your choice. We have hoop pines and carry pines and Queensland white beech. All kinds of high quality timber mixed up with other trees. Some of them actually understory fruit trees. It doesn't really matter. This is a vague outer system. We're pruning some trees like the Grevillea robusta silky oak here to, be, to grow straighter, 
so we'll get a good straight pole out. And these timbers will replace all the timber in the infrastructure in the buildings with better timber than the buildings are built with right now. This will be high class replacement and it will go on forever. There will never be a shortage of timber on this property or any property that we want to design with good zone for sustainable timber or forest products in general. All the forest products can be in surplus. And community forestry can produce forests forever for the community. And there's no reason why we can't all have free materials to build our own houses. It's just a matter of community cooperation on community forest land around our human settlements. Easy design, great design, sustainable forever, no problem. simply form created by the pressure between two media like the wind over the ocean creates the waves of the ocean and that is how all pattern is formed and no matter how chaotic it may seem in natural systems there is order in the chaos formed by the pattern this is how energy is trapped in biological systems we need to understand that so we can be sustainable by design. By looking for simple patterns, dendritic patterns, branching patterns, are also the patterns of rivers and tiny little patterns on leaves. There are spiral patterns, there are tessellation patterns, there are circles within circles. There are just a few pattern forms, but there are many, many, many variations, an innumerable set of imperfections in pattern. Our job is not to recreate pattern. Our job as designers is to let patterns evolve and uncover the patterns within our systems and then harmonize with them. Only use the patterns as a guide, something that tells you, I'm harmonizing with the natural system, I'm harmonizing with the natural patterns, I know that that means I'm going to be more efficient. Application of pattern is an important part of design. Not just looking at pretty patterns in nature or designing for pattern's sake, but actually finding functional patterns that work for you. Here I am in the middle of a great big mulch pit. This is over a, a meter and a half deep and a meter high almost above the ground and it's full of mulch and surrounded by soil that's come out of the hole and around it is a gilding of plants, a pattern guild really, bananas, taro, there's aracasha, there's sweet potato, there's some mints, there's a whole mixture of plants, mainly bananas, yakon, I can see some yakon there, sweet root, but this is a really functional design because the edge on the inside of the planted circular row is taken up by the mulch and the outside is taken up by the rampant productive grain covers like pinto peanut and other types of, of plants that are very abundant. We're in a phase of abundance and most of it's productive. Great application of pattern. Works anywhere, you can grow bananas, papayas or palm trees. 
and can probably be applied to other species in other climates as well. Pattern has to be functional so that it saves us energy. So when we look at patterns in nature, we look at ways that pattern works in a functional, energy-saving way. The very pattern that we use to put a banana circle together appears in the stem of the banana itself. It's a set of circles within a set of circles. It's actually a set of leaf stems together in the banana itself, repeated in the banana circle. We know we're on the right track. We're playing the game to the rules of the game. That's the way we know that we'll get accumulated and surplus energy within our system. We're harmonizing with the patterns of nature. Patterns in landscape. All the harvesting patterns in the form of swales, creating edges. Driveway plantings of bamboo, creating edges to pasture. Edges on contour down through the main crop. Edges of driveways planted to different systems, creating edge opportunities. All around us throughout design, I'm stood in amongst the cover crop of, of nitro and fixing cowpea. This creates an edge to a car park. Around us we see a flowing edge curving through the landscape, that's contour, connected to the spillway of a dam, an edge overflow system. Everywhere we look, there are edges and edges that are opportunities for design. Only on edges are opportunities to harvest freely available surplus. The more convenient, practical edges that you can put through polycultural systems, the more stable they are. Aquaculture, the most productive of all systems, the most productive plants by weight come from water, water chestnut. Lotus root, the most productive mulch, typhus, cattails, bulrush, the most productive by mass the most productive leaf crop in the world. Kang Kong, Ipomoea, Aquatica. The aquaculture protein production, 30 times more productive than land-based protein. That's our fish productions. Maybe 50 times more productive in the tropics. There are plants, there are fish, there's organic matter. The fastest soil building mechanism on Earth, shallow lakes and ponds. Maybe shallow marine systems just gets in front of it a fraction, but shallow lakes and ponds, more productive than forest in soil creation, anaerobic soil on the bottom of the pond. Great polycultural interaction. The small scale aquaculture, what people have done for centuries. Great stuff great interaction, creates the most beautiful edges, little flows of water, mimics nature, a wonderful thing to live around, very easy to get production from. <sighs> what looks like a big messy swampy load of rampant plants is really, but this is one of the tubers of the tropics, this is taro, and this is the potato of the subtropics, really. It's your carbohydrate crop. And what we've got here is an edge between water and land, an edge system, a swamp. And this is a swamp plant with the assistance of water. Anything in water doesn't have to fight gravity as much as land-based systems. All the animals on land are always fighting against gravity. Most of the elements in water have a gravity-free environment. They float around, so they're more productive taro on the edge of water and land. Here's a water flow coming down from the lotus pond down to the water chestnut pond before it then goes on to the main dam below. These are silt traps and productive systems. So they're productive and functional. Little fish in here to make sure there's no mosquitoes. Just above this there's a level terrace that holds water separates, divides the, the flow of the water, taking the energy out of the water 
and above that there's another level terrace dividing the water and above that there's a, a circular footpath around a palm circle like the banana circle but a productive palm circle we'll go up and have a look at that too So here's the palm circle, full of mulch, and the water divides either side of the palm circle, comes on down, and then spreads on this level terrace, then comes down either side of the level terrace, drops into another level terrace, then drops into the lotus pond, then the water chestnut pond, and then the dam. This pacifies the flow of the water, drops the sediment and nutrient and silt traps, grows all these productive plants, and keeps the bottom dam clean for high quality fish production. Aquaculture by design, using the patterns of nature. Observation of the patterns that are all around us and the way that Energy is harvested through harmonious pattern assemblies. Pattern, the edge between chaos and harmony, the ultimate expression of a natural system is the point where it goes from harmony to chaos. That edge is the ultimate opportunity for creativity and productivity. This is the wow factor in permaculture. This is the glue that puts it together, that sticks it together, that we all inherently understand. It comes from our ancestral knowledge of survival. We all have it and we can all make links to it. This is a subject that is not taught in any other system. And this is a subject that would probably be excluded by most academics. And yet all people understand pattern in some form, especially children. It's so easy to teach to children, the elderly and traditional people who are not drowning in technology, who can respect the patterns of nature. Here is the form, here is the classroom, here is the teacher. This is the system that has survived for millennia and will continue to survive. This is the diversity nature's university. The energy of flow patterns in water, just a gorgeous thing, changing endlessly but repeating in form, little overbecks going through the system. What we have to do is we have to look at pattern and find a functional relationship so that we can say, okay, this is a useful tool, this is one of the most useful tools. So we have to look at the boundary patterns, the boundary and edges only in natural systems are the lessons that we need to know about harvesting surplus. Only on edges and ecotones do we get accumulated surplus in nature. That's an absolute constant. So when we replicate that in our designs, when we extend edges, when we work the boundaries, when we work the interactions, then we get harvestable surplus and we get productive systems that also benefit the natural system itself. We build soil. When we build soil and get production, we're sustainable. And that's what we want to be and that's what we need to be.
As designers of systems, we have to realize that the landscape profile that we work in is very important. Are we on flat country or flattish country? Are we on hill country? Are we on rounded country? Are we on steep volcanic country? Are we on deserts that are angular and sharp and shaped by heat and wind and occasional large water flows and evaporation? Are we, or are we on the rounded landscape of the humid landscapes? Then the other systems that we need to very clearly understand is which climate are we in? There's three major climates. The temperate zone that has a cool winter a wet winter and a dry summer. The tropical zone, which has a wet summer and a dry winter. An arid zone, which has a, a climate where evaporation is much higher than rainfall. And then there are subclimates. We can be on a, a little low island a tropical island or a, or a sand or coral island. They have specific design requirements. Or a high island with basalt or granite. These are things we need to take into account when we design. Right? Because they're little design specifics that have to be explained in relation to climate, in relation to landscape profiles. And you can have a climate that's directly related to the climatic effect, what's called the orographic effect. The effect on the climate by the landscape, orographic. So we're really looking at the biogeography, the life of the geography, the life of the land in relation to climate and landscape profiles. And this is what a good design course a good permaculture design certificate course will explain to you and along with your design system and your translation of natural patterns and how to use them you'll be able to design anywhere on any climate any landscape Queensland White Beach, an endemic tree of this particular area. High quality timber, no splinters, very fine grain, used as a boat building timber, handrails on some of the old traditional houses. Beautiful ivory white colour. Phases of abundance extending good elements throughout the system. We can go into a phase of abundance so easily. We know that ecosystems major in trees and trees are one of the elements that stabilize our climate. Transpiration, soil cycles, buffering of wind creating microclimate, condensation. The condensation drip is never counted much in the precipitation figures crucially important in dry lands where the condensation drip can be equivalent to 80% of the desert rainfall but without the trees without the ecosystem that majors in trees you don't get the condensating surface any of us can harvest appropriate seed for systems any of us can put together nurseries that create phases of abundance that go on forever there's more trees here than we can plant and there always is and there probably always will be. We live in a happier and a, a more abundant situation when our human habitat is supported by living systems, ecosystems which major in trees. Diverse, productive, stable, habitat for wildlife, soil creative ecosystems. It's all about those extended permanent patterns which give us permanent yield and permanent stability. We'll moderate the flows of our rivers, we'll have less floods, we'll have less droughts, we'll moderate our climate, 
all these things are possible. It's just a matter of accepting that and getting on with the job. And it's a good job. It's a great job. It's the only game in town, really. It's the only, it's, it's the only optimistic future. Everything else just looks like a, a dead end. Literally a dead end. Soil, an imperative of permaculture. That soil creation is something that is created by good design. If we're to be sustainable, we must create soil. We must increase the quality of soil and the quantity of soil by the processes which we work. If we're not creating soil, we can't be sustainable. We can fertilize by imitating the forest floor by creating compost. Biologically active compost stimulates the soil life. We can create compost worm farms. We can create our own natural fertilizer. This is what we have to do to create good biological stimulants that will actually keep the soil alive, increasing in quality and quantity as long as we're good stewards of the landscape. So creating our own fertilizer is a matter of using the processes of decomposition to create compost. Underneath here is a windrow of compost It's warm and it's nearly at the end of its process. And it's really a way of creating good soil biology. So that there's lots of little organisms in here, both bacteria and fungi, by the billions. So it's really stimulating the ecosystem of the soil that's the most important part the soil creation and that's what we do with these these systems we actually imitate the decomposition under the forest floor so that we can create an extension of the soil biology and it's never that you're feeding the plants you're feeding the soil and the soil organisms are then feeding the plants. It's their interaction, it's their combinations of action. The cooperation between the plants and the soil organisms. So in an organic sense, you're only ever feeding the soil. Here we have our compost worms. Hundreds and hundreds of them. <laughs> Compost worms eating manure, eating vegetable scraps, creating high quality fertilizer. This is the material they, they produce. There. It's a tomato growing out of it. And that's the, the high quality castings that are the end result of a good quality worm farm. It's a simple system. It's mostly manure with vegetable scraps on top. You can add as much as you like. Worms will eat their own weight every day. They create this liquid, this worm juice, which is full of bacteria, beneficial bacteria. And you can water it down 20 to 1 as a liquid fertilizer, or you can just put it on straight onto the garden. It doesn't burn. It's uh, just a life enhancing system full of soil biology. So it's quite safe to put it on straight. 
and will just stimulate the soil organisms. So with this and compost, we get all our fertilizer with a little bit of backup from uh, chop and drop legume trees, add in organic matter to the soil. Every day there's juice, every three months there's a whole bath full of high quality worm castings. Here's some finished compost and uh, that's already broken right down. That's pretty high quality stuff. There's, oh, there's a little worm in there, baby worm. There's a little compost worm there. Uh, that's a good sign. And this is our other fertilizer, high quality compost. Another little worm there. So that's, that's a little bit fluffier than the worm castings, which is stickier. And because there's a lot of wood and a relationship between the fungi and the wood, there's beneficial, more beneficial fungi in here than there is in the worm farm castings. The worm castings are, are mainly bacteria, um, very little fungi, and this has a lot of beneficial fungi as well. So two great solid materials. And this is just made out of, out of manure and plant material, green and brown, high carbon and high nitrogen materials mixed together and created into compost. Now that, with a combination of the right planning guilds, will create good soil. And it's the soil biology that does the work. Underneath the ground covers here, you'll find that the soil will be full of crumbs. It'll be a crumb soil. Lovely. There's a lot of organic matter down here because we chop and drop a lot of it. There's a lot of sticks and things. But here, I can smell mint. I've just pulled my way through a mint. There's a bit of the pinto peanut underneath the pinto peanut under here. Getting ready, there it is. Getting ready to take over as the next succession. And the weeds are being smothered, but there at the soil surface, that almost looks like the compost. That's the soil biology converting the organic matter to something that's a very close to a the compost, it's a high organic matter soil. Started off as a grey sand, and it's still a sandy soil, but now it's a lot darker and has a really good texture. Soil creation by stimulating biology, that's all you need to know about. And here are layers and layers and layers of organic matter that have just been chopped down in a very rough way and smothered by this ground cover with this high humidity under here. There's a great rot. In all climates, here's a piece of bamboo, quite a strong piece of material normally, just moist and breaking down in the humidity. It doesn't matter, a bit of fungus hanging on the side of it there, breaking it down. A little bit of floppy fungus there. You're stimulating all these actions in the soil to imitate the forest. And it doesn't matter which climate you're in, if you, if you enhance the soil biology in the desert, it's just a matter of doing using principles that actually um, d displace the action of, of, of evaporation, anti-evaporation strategies in the desert, high humidity breakdown in the tropics, extending of the, of the wet rotting winter in, in uh, temperate, anything that actually breaks down organic matter, anything that extends the breakdown of organic matter. So let's go and have a look at the natural system. Let's go into this forested gully here and see what's happening in the natural system because it will be exactly the same. So we're going through a set of zone four forestry trees and we're going in, there's a few native trees here we've planted and we're going into a natural regrowth system. But in here, there is a lot of organic matter naturally. So here we've gone through the edge of our planting into the natural forest. So here we are. When we look down at the ground, 
what do we see? Mulch, tons of mulch. And it, it's kind of gone through the weedy stage to the weeds being almost insignificant. And here we have lots of fungus. It's a breakdown of organic matter. There's a little fungal hyphae going everywhere. And the soil's crumbly too. The soil's that same sandy soil right at the surface lots and lots of little crumbs. Actually, our soil under the sweet potato looks a little bit better than this. We're actually doing a better job than the natural forest, it looks like. Because that soil's not quite as deep as ours. We've gone through into a different color quicker. So we've speeded up the processes of nature by imitating nature itself. We've looked at the system and said, okay, that's how it works. Let's do it and let's rev it up. Let's get it going faster. Let's enhance the, the biological actions. Let's get into good sustainable production. Now we're actually inside the teacher, <laughs> which is where you've got to be. <laughs>
and the passive overflow that just soaks into the landscape. But then when the rain stopped, I swell soaked in, there it goes. Look at it go. It's actually soaking right in there in front of our eyes. Woof, gone. And our dam's full. And the landscape's hydrated. There we have it in, in miniature. The whole process of rehydration of landscape through design. And we're stabilizing landscape so that we're introducing more and more diversity and the major element are tree lines on contour, which are also rehydration lines as soaked swells linked to water impoundment dams. This works in miniature and it works in the large landscape as well, from the micro to the macro. This is a winning system. Strategies for an alternative global nation, the invisible structures, the people systems. This is where we have to work with the formal and informal economies, where we need to set up an ethical basis of an alternative global nation. This is where village development and land access become important. How do we access land? How do we set up bioregional organizations so people can extend trade between each other, set up the personalities and identify the personalities of, of bioregions? What is the fingerprint of your local systems and your systems where you know the careers and the products and the, and the professions that identify we the people, the extended families. These systems lead us to alternatives to political systems. This is where ethics are the way we invest in natural capital. We can set up local energy trading systems, let systems, even local currency systems where we trade on our own value our own value of product within systems. This is where we can create a new United Nations, where nations can be defined not just by their political boundaries or their national boundaries. Nations can be de defined by language groups, by cultures, but they can also be defined by a nation of people who think the same way. Permaculture is a nation of people, an international global nation of people who think the same way that a, a positive, safe, peaceful, abundant future is possible by design.